Good morning. Well, thank you very much uh, for your interest in understanding what the Army's doing to advance multi-domain operations. I thought the video uh, was a useful way to at least see the overarching concept, uh, understanding why our Army's doing what it's doing. Uh, and today what we want to do is describe for you what we're doing in U.S. Army Pacific to make that a reality. Uh, you know, you've already heard uh, from many of our senior leaders, the Secretary of the Army, the Chief Staff of the Army have laid out in very clear terms in the speeches here uh, our priority, our focus, uh, and what we're doing to get the capabilities as well as generate the formations uh, we need to execute multi-domain operations in the future. Uh, in that future, uh, as you can tell from the video, it's really now. We, we need this now. We need this today. Uh, but we've got to organize, uh, we've got to man, train, and equip uh, to get there. Uh, as the, uh, you know, facilitator indicated, I'm Major General Pete Johnson, uh, normally the Deputy Commanding General for U.S. Army Pacific. Right now I have the uh, distinct privilege to be the Acting Commander. Uh, but I'm standing on the shoulders of General Bob Brown, who really volunteered uh, and created the vision and the environment uh, so that the Army could experiment uh, with multi-domain operations and do so in a theater of operations. I'm also standing on the shoulders of Lieutenant General Gary Valeski, uh, the commander of our first corps, who provided the formation uh, from within uh, that we could actually test out uh, some of these principles uh, and create uh, the initial formation that the Army is using to move forward, which is the multi-domain task force. Uh, what I'm going to try to do for you up front this provides you a little bit of context, uh, context of the threat uh, that we're facing, uh, the environment that we operate in. I talked to you about the guidance uh, that we're receiving uh, as a command out there uh, in a theater of operations, uh, and also then talk to you a little bit about what we're doing, what, some of the lessons that we've learned from our experiences fighting multi-domain operations as a four-star uh, warfighting headquarters. Uh, then also tell you a little bit about what we're doing to sort of innovate and experiment going in the future. And then my intent is to hand off to uh, two great colonels. Uh, one, uh, Colonel Tony Crawford, our chief of our futures division, and he's going to drill down into more specifics on how we've evolved, uh, as well as some of the very specific capabilities uh, that we believe we must have uh, to move forward, not only with a concept, uh, but to apply that concept against a very uh, robust uh, threat picture that we're facing. And then we'll hand it off uh, to Colonel Joe Roller, who will describe for you, he's the, he was the futures uh, lead for First Corps. He will describe for you uh, the First Corps experience uh, and some of the lessons that they uh, had given, you know, the experience moving forward with multi-domain task force. Next slide. In the Indo-Pacific, it is all about China. Uh, that is the threat. That is what is creating uh, the environment from which uh, and the lens that we're looking at uh, on generating uh, capabilities in our Army in the Pacific. Uh, China uh, is uh, very clearly seeking to dominate uh, the region. Uh, they're doing so uh, with a whole government approach uh, because they can. Very centralized uh, structure uh, with the Communist Party, etc. Uh, but they can generate effects across the region uh, using holy government, especially economic. Uh, you've seen examples of coercive economic uh, policies. You've seen the example of debt trap diplomacy. Uh, we've got, you know, examples now in the, in the Indo-Pacific where countries have had to cede their sovereign territory because they haven't been able to climb out of the debt uh, that, you know, due to poorly negotiated uh, arrangements uh, with China. It's very, very real. But what's driving multi-domain operations and our adaptations in the Indo-Pacific is the military threat. Uh, the modernization and the development of an incredibly robust counter-intervention capability, a layered standoff capability, an A2AD, uh, anti-access, aerial denial capability, however you want to describe it, uh, but the bottom line, uh, from being able to observe and being able to direct and target uh, from the mainland forward is becoming an incredibly difficult situation uh, for any 
uh, force or any of our allies or partners uh, in the region. Uh, they are creating a contested zone uh, from their mainland on out. And for us, it's certainly over the first island chain. You can see that on the, uh, on the map in the, in the top right there, uh, which includes many of our allies like Japan, uh, Philippines, uh, Thailand, uh, and then beyond. Uh, the second island chain into our interest uh, from the United States uh, of America's perspective uh, well into our lines of communication. Essentially, uh, the situation we have now is we cannot assure ourselves to have superiority in any single domain as we take a look at this broad counter-intervention uh, capability uh, that China has not only put in place now, uh, but continues uh, to improve. Uh, to the extent uh, they're even extending forward, if you take a look at the South China Sea context, uh, they're using the island features and the other uh, features in the South China Sea to help project uh, that counter-intervention capability even deeper uh, into the region, uh, making it that much more difficult uh, for everybody. Uh, the other thing that I think you've got to understand about the region is really the archipelagic reality. Uh, you know, there's island nation states and there's a lot of water uh, out there. So when the Army uh, looks, the United States Army looks to support our allies and partners in the region, uh, we're certainly going to be heavily reliant on them uh, for positional advantage. Uh, we are already fighting from a position of disadvantage, uh, I would offer. Uh, but it's clearly because of the just the geographical nature, the physical realities, uh, the demand on cross-domain capability is, is apparent, hopefully for everybody. It means that the Army, defending one of our allies and partners on land, is going to have to engage forces in the maritime and the air. Uh, that's, uh, there's, there's not a land bridge of the, uh, the Chinese, uh, the tanks and artillery that are going to be moving forward. It's really going to be fought uh, on sea and in the air, and that's what we're lasered in on. That means for us to get there, we've got to be able to maneuver by air, operational level maneuver by air and by sea. And we've got, uh, we've got a lot of work uh, to do uh, to, to that uh, accord. Uh, as I already said, reliant uh, heavily just because of the nature uh, of where our allies and partners are at, we're going to be reliant on them uh, for the access uh, in order to place our capabilities and our formations in a position of advantage where we can then uh, operate. Uh, forward posture uh, in competition uh, and in crisis and in conflict is going to be an imperative that we've got to work through. What are we being asked to do? Well, clearly ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, what is that? That uh, respect for sovereignty, uh, re you know, uh, an absolute uh, requirement for access to the commons, the air, the sea, et cetera, a free flow of commerce and trade. Uh, that is the environment uh, that we believe that the United States and our allies and partners in World War II created. That's that world order uh, that we believe has benefited uh, certainly the United States, but has benefited every country in the region, uh, to include China. We've got to work to strengthen and, and build uh, allies and partners. Uh, we cannot uh, expect to, we, we can't do this alone. Uh, and I see many of our partners uh, here and our allies in the audience, uh, and it is through our partnership, our, our training together, building interoperability, uh, that's going to be essential uh, in any crisis or conflict in the region. Uh, we're going to compete uh, actively now and with the intent to not only compete uh, for clear message uh, and positional advantage, but also to demonstrate the combat credibility of our overall formation, not only for the United States Army, uh, but the joint force and our allies and partners. Uh, and we're going to do so in a way that prevents us from going to conflict. We do not want to have conflict in the Indo-Pacific region. It would be catastrophic for the globe uh, if we did that. Uh, our intent is unambiguous. Our intent is to absolutely compete and expand the competition, create positional advantage, but to do so in a way that deters 
uh, conflict. That's the baseline context uh, that we're operating in. Next slide. So what are we doing? Uh, well, as I said, we're war fighting, and for the first time, we're a, a certified uh, four-star level JTF headquarters, U.S. Army Pacific. And we're also a standing uh, JFLIC, Joint Force Land Component uh, Command. And, and in that role, uh, we have actually embraced already, even though it, multi-domain operations is a concept, we took key principles from that, and we have already embraced the principles and have been exercising at the theater level uh, and the operational and tactical level of war uh, multi-domain operations uh, in the Indo-Pacific against uh, the adversaries that uh, we described here earlier. Uh, we believe that those exercises have informed us. Uh, they've, uh, they've already told us very clearly that multi-domain operations is the way we must uh, move forward. Uh, the ability of any single service uh, to accomplish the mission in the Pacific uh, is, is, is just not reality. It's, there's no way. Uh, and we're going to have to do operations in a way that I think we've never done before. This is beyond joint. Uh, this is beyond the ability to assure that we have interdependent capabilities between the services. We've got to get to a place now where we can really fully jointly integrate uh, in time and space uh, and, and identification of decisive space uh, where we can bring all of that to bear rapidly and continuously. We don't have the, uh, we're not going to have the luxury of planning all of these joint plays out in advance. Uh, we're going to have to be able to operate jointly in a fully integrated uh, fashion uh, dynamically. And, and I think that's the essence of multi-domain operations. And that's not easy. Uh, but we've, we've had some uh, great uh, learning out in the Pacific. One, we've realized because of the nature of the environment that land absolutely can and must enable joint force maneuver. Uh, land has some advantages. Uh, our challenge will be getting there certainly uh, to land. And as I said, uh, you know, we've got to work through those challenges. Uh, our allies and partners are going to be essential in that role. But if we can get there, uh, the advantage that we now offer for the joint force maneuver uh, is very, very clear. The survivability of land forces, uh, I think uh, history uh, bears that out, uh, is, uh, is one of the key strengths of that sort of maneuver. Uh, but also, it will allow us to have in place now land-based capabilities uh, across domain. Land-based anti-ship. Land-based anti-air land-based anti-space, land-based anti-cyber. It creates options for the joint force commander to have layered uh, options, not just one option out of a single service, but now it presents uh, to the adversary multiple dilemmas, uh, not just positionally, but also uh, by capabilities. Now, when they take a look at what they got to do to protect their ships, they have to look multidimensionally, and it creates a huge uh, problem for them. It would be for us, and we know that. Uh, we also uh, think that the, the notion of convergence uh, that you'll, you'll see in our multidomain uh, operations concept is essential. Uh, one of the things that we learned was that we're not only going to have to converge horizontally, meaning across the joint force, but for effect, we're going to need to converge vertically. We're going to have to take a look at what we're doing at Echelon in time and space and make sure we can converge those capabilities. And it doesn't stop with a military component of dime. We need to now take a hard look at how we're doing, how we're converging across dime, the diplomatic space, okay, the informational uh, space, uh, and the economic space, because not only do we have to penetrate a very robust uh, counter-intervention capability, a stand, layered standoff capability, but I believe fundamentally we're going to have to penetrate the cognitive space. We're going to have to penetrate the cognitive space in a way that clearly sends the message and the signals to the leaders on the opposing side to say, this is not going to be worth it. Uh, and even if we do get into crisis, uh, we can find a way to de-escalate. And if we get into conflict, 
we can find the earliest opportunity uh, to drive the off-ramp, uh, to get back to a position where we want to be in. And so I think the concepts of convergence is not only the kinetic and the physical on defeating the military capabilities, but we're also going to, I think, need to expand that reality uh, to thinking about the information space and the cognitive space of the decision makers uh, on the opposing uh, force. We're testing, we're experimenting, uh, we've opened the door uh, to, the, to not only the Army but the Joint Force and our international partners uh, to identify opportunities uh, to, to, to see what we can do to integrate capabilities and networks and tactics and techniques uh, in a way that will inform uh, the advancement of multi-domain operations. Uh, we're certainly focused on long-range uh, multi-domain fires. Uh, and when I say multi-domain, I'm not just talking about surface to surface. Uh, I'm talking about we're also thinking about surface to air uh, in a unique way. Uh, traditionally, our Army has thought about uh, air and missile defense. Uh, what do we got to do to position uh, resources in a way to protect our force so we're more survivable? We now need to flip that and go on the offense and find ways from the land to impact the air battle the air battle at range uh, in support of the joint force. That's another dilemma uh, we've got to work for to, to present uh, to the enemy. Uh, the fires in C2 network, uh, certainly we have one today, but it's not fully jointly integrated. Uh, but we've got to get to a place, sensor, shooter, agnostic, and we've got to get to a place where when the comms go down, when the comms go down from the strategic to the theater to the operational, as that, uh, as that becomes highly degraded, we still have the capabilities to engage in a multi-domain fashion at the cutting edge of this battle. Uh, and that's what multi-domain task force, we believe, is going to be able to provide not only the theater commander, but the operational commander forward uh, into fight from competition through crisis uh, into conflict. Uh, we've also, as I you know, indicated earlier, we've got to be able to maneuver in this environment. We've got to be able to get the capabilities and the forces uh, where we need them and when we need them. And that is going to be by air and by ground, I mean by sea. And so as we take a look at maritime maneuver uh, for Army forces, uh, that obviously harkens back to an era uh, you know, gone by in World War II, but we have got to think through that. And we've got to modernize uh, our maritime fleet on the Army side and certainly find ways to connect the dots and the joint force with our Navy teammates and our Marine teammates to create the opportunities to the, get these land force capabilities, both Army and Marine, uh, to places where we can achieve uh, positional advantage. Now what I'd like to do is hand it off to, uh, as I said, a phenomenal Colonel Tony uh, Crawford. He has been on this journey uh, in U.S. Army Pacific from the beginning. It's been about a 22-month journey, and he's been there from the start. Tony, all yours. Thank you, sir. As uh, General Johnson said, my name is Tony Crawford. I'm the director of the Futures uh, Division there at USERPAC. Uh, one of my primary responsibilities, or one of our, our director's primary responsibilities, is to coordinate and facilitate the multi-domain task force pilot program that we've been executing, it's good to see you, sir, that we've been executing for about 22 months now. And so my intent this morning is to give you a quick update of where we are with that pilot program, where we're going, what's next, and then I'm going to hand it off to Colonel Joe Roller from First Corps, who's going to give you a very uh, more refined look at some of the lessons learned. But I'm going to give you some of the lessons learned from a use of pack and theater perspective, as well as uh, how we're informing both U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, Army Futures Command, and ongoing modernization efforts from some of the results of this program. So next slide, please. So as, as many of you know, we, uh, the Army has begun to fundamentally relook our foundational operating concepts, which is driving us towards multi-domain operations. And if you were lucky enough yesterday to attend the left of uh, conflict discussion with General Wesley and his team, very good lay down on competition and what that means. So in the interest of time, I won't belabor a lot of that, but the, Ar the Army in the Pacific has been um, in parallel with these refinements of our operating concepts since the beginning. And really our momentum out there came from LANPAC, which is uh, AUSA's event for Land Forces Pacific in 2016 when Admiral Harris, the then PACOM commander, was asked, what can the Army do here in the Pacific? And, and it, that quote tells you, he said, I need the Army to be able to sink ships, shoot down satellites, shoot down missiles, and prevent the enemy from communicating. So he gave us some pretty clear guidance back in 2016, which then kind of shaped what we thought an MDTF might need to look like as we move forward. Next slide, please. So General Johnson talked about some of the basic tenets of uh, MD, MDO, 
the concept, so our, our foundational operational concept that we are using as the foundation for our joint warfighting concept in the Pacific. But as he said, it's expanding the competition space, presenting those multiple dilemmas for the enemy, and really it's, it's to deter. Uh, we don't want to get to conflict in the Pacific. It's very clearly articulated by both COM, Indo PACOM, as well as uh, every leader in the Pacific to include our partners and allies. It's all about deterrence and creating those capabilities to expand the competitive space and deter conflict in the Pacific. Uh, next slide, please. So the multi-domain task force pilot program. In October of 2017, HQDA directed user PAC to conduct a pilot program to test MDO concepts and experiment with our organic forces, our assigned forces in the Pacific, integrating them into our very robust joint exercises. So for the past uh, 20 months or so, we've integrated elements of First Corps, specifically 17th FA Brigade, 2ID Devardi and others, into about nine different major joint training, joint and combined training exercises, about 12 TTXs, war games and seminars in order to inform the, the build of the, the multi-domain task force, what it's gonna look like in the future, as well as assist U.S. Training and Doctrine Command with the refinement of multi-domain operations as a concept. So the, the last major event that the, um, that the MDTF pilot program just, just completed was Orient Shield 19 with our Japanese partners and allies, as well as we linked that globally with Cyber Blitz, which was the first time the I-2Qs and Lieutenant Colonel Nishimura, uh, the first time the I-2Qs was able to get their hands on some of the equipment that they will be issued as, as an operational unit and experiment with that equipment to include uh, space, cyber, and electromagnetic operations across the electromagnetic spectrum. So that just culminated last month. Uh, that was globally linked with the MDTF headquarters that was operating in the islands of Japan with the, the cyber elements and the space elements which were at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst uh, conducting live operations. Next slide. So what it's also informed is Commando PACOM some required capabilities. And you can see up there that Commando PACOM, as General Johnson said, he is a, he is a full supporter of multi-domain operations and sees it as the Army's advancement of MDO and MDTF is essential to assuring operational maneuver here in the Pacific. And these are some of the, the key uh, capabilities that we require in order to implement his vision for conducting operations in the Pacific. And, they, and I won't read them all to you, but uh, as General Johnson said, long-range multi-domain fires, uh, a modernized expeditionary layered air and missile defense, as well as um, counter air capability. And if operating in the areas we're gonna be operating in extended ranges, range is always um, the most desirable aspect of, of land-based fires, but it's not the only aspect that's required. And then of course, uh, for survivability, that's a, that's a pretty robust uh, counter intervention layer that's been established by some of our potential adversaries. So that uh, ability to uh, conduct camouflage, concealment, deception activities in order to ensure survivability uh, is, is key as well. And so uh, this is driving not only um, COM, Indo, PACOM capabilities are driving Army modernization efforts, but also joint modernization efforts uh, throughout our sister components. So I went pretty fast because I want to give Joe some time and make sure we have some time for questions. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Colonel Joe Roller from First Corps. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Colonel Joe Roller. I'm the Chief of Future Operations for America's First Corps at JBLM. So I have two slides. I'll go rather quickly through both of them. Uh, and what I'll talk about is basically going to reiterate some of the things that General Johnson's already talked about. And if you were at the left of conflict discussion yesterday, you'll hear similar concepts of our lessons learned uh, from the last 22 months of uh, executing the MDTF pilot program. So go to the next slide, please. So some of you may have seen this slide before in different presentations. But as you look at it, it's a construct for an A2AD network, and it's executed in depth through multiple domains. Across the bottom of the slide, you have the different levels of command. Within the different levels of command, you have different authorities and capabilities at each of those echelons. As we look at our tar targeting methodology within MDO, uh, we're looking at critical capabilities, vulnerabilities, requirements, and center of gravity analysis in order to develop that convergence that General Johnson was talking about at Echelon, we know where there's, those critical vulnerabilities are so we can target them uh, systematically and we're taking down the network as a whole. And that create, basically punches a hole in that A2AD bubble, allows us to advance maneuverability to get a force onto the target and out. So 
uh, if you can go to, go to the next slide, I'll have, I have five key takeaways uh, that we've learned over the past uh, 22 months, nine various exercises, either joint, multinational, uh, in their arrangement. So the first being exploita exploitation planning as is important as a penetration. So I talked about uh, at Echelon how we penetrate that bubble and deliver the force. Knowing that the network is adaptive, it could potentially close around our force while it's in the bubble. So a detailed plan on getting them out as is important in the planning efforts uh, to ensure that we are successful not only on target, but getting a force out of that bubble as well. The next piece, uh, targeting destroys networks at Echelon. So it's not individual nodes that we're focusing on, it's the holistic approach uh, to taking that network down, delivering the force, providing us flexibility. And it's not just one echelon that's doing that, it's multiple echelons. And in a degraded environment, the importance of authorities and layered authorities to give commanders at lower levels, especially in a degraded environment, the capability to execute targeting in that very complex network. The, the next piece is the uh, joint multinational integration. So as we went through various exercises, and General Johnson alluded to it earlier, it, it's, a, it's a whole uh, of enterprise approach, it's a joint approach, it's a multinational approach. So each component uh, brings their subject matter expertise, brings their own capabilities, similar to our, 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 our international partners that come and participate in these exercises. When we combine all of those effects together with detailed planning, uh, we have very, very successful effects against the holistic networks and bringing them down uh, and achieving higher level uh, strategic applications. The, the next aspect is the national level uh, collection. So as we look at degraded and de denied environments, that's going to have impacts on our ability at the operational level to do collection uh, and continue to develop our understanding of the environment. By having national level uh, intelligence collection providing inputs to us, we can continue our development of the understanding of the operational environment and continue to pursue our strategic objectives. The last piece and probably the most, com uh, the most important piece is the, the importance of a joint common operating picture. So any talk that you've ever been in, uh, you need to make sure you have a good cop so the commander has a good understanding and visualization of the environment so he can make uh, appropriate decisions at key, key times. And when we're talking about multi-domain, those decisions are split second. So as we look at the interoperability, not only within the joint force, but our coalition partners, that's one of the areas that we really need to continue to focus on is refining that connectivity uh, in order to establish a good purple or joint cop to allow commanders to visualize the fight and make those decisions at a timely manner. And at this time, I'll turn it back over to General Johnson for any closing comments. No closing comments, uh, Joe, Tony, uh, phenomenal job, appreciate it. So I think we got about 10 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, for questions, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them. Do we have mics? There we go, all right. Sir, uh, Colonel Tim Klensky, I'm from uh, JPO Chem Bio Defense. Has any of the TTXs or simulations uh, looked at the impact of a seaburn event uh, during the penetration phase? They, they certainly have in the, uh, in the peninsula uh, fight. So as we take a look at what are the right, uh, you know, multi-domain operational concepts and whatnot to deliver in a, in a Korea context, there has been some work there. Uh, but in the broader context, we have not really uh, pulled that thread uh, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the amount you might think, partly because of the threat picture. Uh, that is not uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the most significant part of the threat picture when we take a look at the broader regional challenge that we're dealing with. Uh, it hasn't risen uh, to, to that level. Uh, but we're going to need to get there. Uh, and certainly I think uh, for the you know, potential conflict on the peninsula, that would be, I think, front and center. Uh, there's been, I think, some work there uh, to that regard. But as we've taken a look at the broader integration of multi-domain operation at the year level, we have not yet done that. Appreciate the question. Uh, 
I'm an adjunct up at uh, SSI at the War College. Yes, sir. How, how does the MDPF concept differ from the Marine Corps VADO? Is it more of the same, or are you doing something different? I think there's an intersection. Uh, certainly what the Marines are trying to do as part of the Navy Marine team, uh, providing options, uh, certainly part of the Navy Marine team to get forces uh, ashore, long-range precision fires, et cetera. I think what's different is what we're doing uh, to place a capability forward in the fight that can truly integrate. It can assess and integrate across all of the domains. That I've not yet quite seen uh, in, the, uh, in the Marine concept. I'm sure they can get there. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's lessons uh, on both sides. Uh, but we're working with the Marines, the Navy, uh, and the Air Force uh, as we take a look at the overarching joint warfighting concept that we're going to have to deliver uh, to get the win. And it's going to achieve, uh, it's going it's to require everybody in the fight. And so I think there's, there's complementary uh, capabilities there in long-range precision fires, uh, but unique right now what we're doing with the multi-domain task force is, is, is generating what we would call a, a brain. Uh, one of them slides, you had the multi-domain task force. What we've already generated today is what we call the I2Qs, intelligence, information, cyber, electronic warfare, and space uh, capability that serves as sort of a brain uh, for the multi-domain task force. It has all the analytical capability, all the connection to the sensors in those domains, and then the links uh, to the shooters. Uh, the shooters, both kinetic and non-kinetic uh, capabilities. That's what we're really building into the multi-domain task force that I believe is unique at, that, at, at this point. Hi, Major Michael Torrey from the 29th Infantry, Infantry Division, Deputy Seaman Chief. Um, when it comes down to the commander's intent with the operational, like the, the COP for cyberspace and electronic warfare, was the I2Qs able to meet the commander's intent? And what was the systems that you guys were displaying that for? It showed us clearly uh, that the, uh, the potential there is extraordinary. And when we can link the tools uh, in cyber forward on the battlefield addressing the target sets that you need at that echelon, it's just like artillery. You need it at every level, right? And why do you need it at a level level? Because you're trying to address different target sets. And so for us, we saw having that cyber capability there forward focused on the theater or the JFLIC fight forward, uh, it made a huge difference. The challenge in cyber is going to be authorities. And that's, the, that's the, the, the problem set we're working through now. Uh, it's challenging. It's, it's sort of new frontier uh, for, for everybody. Uh, in some cases, we're going to be able to gain uh, better authorities with working with our international allies and partners. Uh, and so we're going to have to stitch together, I think, multi-domain capabilities across that multinational force uh, to, to get the effects that we want uh, to get out there. G'day, sir. Um, we've talked really effectively about uh, those activities in an MDO sense we can achieve in, a, in, in the conflict. I, I'm interested to explore your thoughts about um, what activities in the MDO sense in the competitive space, so we're talking soft power, right. th that are achieving greatest effect in the Indo PACOM at the moment. It's a great question. So, it's what do you do? You always keep this combat credible capability that you're developing. How do you employ it in competition? Uh, that's what we're doing today is trying to figure out, hey, how do we expand the competitive space? I think one of the things that MDTF does, especially forward posture, dynamically forward posture in the theater, it creates uh, a link to de for deterrence. So part of that competitive space outcome has to be deterrence. And so there you've got to present already forward on the edge of this potential conflict zone the ca real capabilities that we'll be able to engage from the start. Uh, and so I think that's where we see a key role. The other role is, you know, when you, you got to be in the environment to know the environment. Uh, and now we take a look at that environment. It's understanding that environment across all the domains. So having a multi-domain task force forward with the uh, analytics, all of the sensor capabilities and whatnot, then you get to understand the environment that you might have to fight in. And that's also another message uh, to a potential adversary to say, hey, look, they already understand the, the terrain. Uh, they're not coming to this. Uh, cold. 
uh, we don't want to come to this kind of fight cold. It's our intent, part of the competitive bargain, uh, is to maneuver in that battle space, in competition, in a way that sets condition for us to fight and win uh, if we have to. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. I think there's an information uh, environment uh, component to this thing as well in, in competition. And so I think leveraging the capabilities that we would use in wartime to kind of advance uh, in the diplomatic space, help inform and educate uh, that diplomatic uh, effort, I think also has, uh, has great potential. Uh, but, but we're working through all of that. That's a great question. I appreciate that. Last question. Sir, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kagiwada from uh, JGSDF, working at your headquarters as a liaison officer. Um, uh, Ground South Defense Force are closely working with uh, our DUSPAC uh, in order to uh, our, the integration of uh, our cross land operations and amount of domain operations. Um, during the presentation of our uh, kind of roller, um, he mentioned about uh, um, identifying uh, critical vulnerability uh, of the competitors. Um, our staff back in Tokyo uh, trying to very hard to uh, figure out how effectively uh, we can do that. Uh, if it's still unclassified material, and it's safe to say, uh, how do you approach to, uh, uh, to the, the, the more, most effective method to identify critical vulnerability? Critical vulnerabilities in the potential adversary or our critical vulnerabilities? Because I think we've got to look both ways. I think one of the things that uh, we're taking a look at here as, uh, as their capabilities uh, increase, we've also got to make sure we understand our vulnerabilities and maneuver uh, to create the best uh, possible uh, advantage uh, that we can. First, I want to thank the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force. They have been instrumental in us operationalizing multi-domain capabilities. Uh, we just did our first deployment of multi-domain task force uh, to Japan uh, as part of Orient Shield. Uh, they also participate in Cyber Blitz, uh, but it's this partnership, this is a very rich partnership, and I think we're pushing each other. Uh, Japanese have a uh, you know, cross-domain operations uh, concept that they're working through and, and generating, trying to generate doctrine. We've got multi-domain, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, and we're working closely hand in hand uh, to get there. Uh, but I think this kind of connects to the compet you know, competition space piece. We've, to, to identify the vulnerabilities, we are going to have to start maneuvering to some degree in the domains uh, to kind of see where those vulnerabilities might, might lie. Uh, we've also got to take a look at our, our uh, you know, the allied and the partnered, uh, you know, understanding. We've got we to take inputs from allies and partners, what everybody is learning in the environment. And I think that's a powerful way to also uh, demonstrate and link, uh, you know, to, to the reality that you do not want to go to conflict because there's going to be a team of teams in the region uh, that have already been collaborating, have already been working through, uh, you know, a way to defend the sovereign interests of each uh, nation in the region, but also, if necessary, uh, to ruck up to something much more significant. Uh, so anyways, I think it's got to be a, a highly collaborative uh, solution set. Uh, and you, sometimes you have to maneuver to drive the intelligence to understand the vulnerabilities. Uh, so I think we're going to need to take a look at what is the maneuver across each of the domains to elicit uh, an understanding uh, of those vulnerabilities. Well, f in closing, one, I do really appreciate uh, your attention to this thing. We do as an Army believe this is vital, this is essential, this is critical uh, to making sure uh, that we can achieve the next win. Uh, the Secretary of the Army and his, uh, his initial message to the force was a clear recognition that we've got to modernize. Uh, we have to modernize and we have to get the capabilities that we do not yet have uh, to be able to go up against 
uh, certainly the potential adversary we see in the Indo-Pacific. And I know that's a team of teams effort. That's what ASA kind of brings to bear. Uh, this is teamwork across industry, across DOD, uh, and across our allies and partners uh, to achieve uh, that absolute reality. Uh, but thank you very much. It's been our pleasure to help give you a window into what U.S. Army Pacific's role has been uh, in advancing multi-domain operations. Cool. Thanks.